Hi, my name is Lee Duncan, and uh, Chris and I are here to talk about namespaces on OpenISCSI. In particular, the problem we are trying to solve is that iSCSI daemon did not work in um, containers. And so uh, people had to have only one daemon running on their system, no matter how many containers they had. So um, Chris had the idea about two or three years ago to, mo to modify it to modify the, the kernel code so that it worked uh, namespace aware. And I took up those patches recently uh, and uh, forward ported them. And we've both been working on it now for a couple months, on and off. And it looks like it's working. We have a patch set we've, we've uh, submitted, that he's submitted, that we both worked on. And so um, he's done m most of the work. I'd like him to, uh, he's got some slides that he would like to show you. And uh, I'm just here for the glory. <laughs> Sure. Um, and so uh, the, the whole idea here was how to, um, there's, there's people trying to, con with iSCSI, we have the uh, control plane split out into user space um, with the daemon, uh, just kind of the way iSCSI uh, had always been developed. Um, and people see a daemon, they try to throw it into a container. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and the main place where I've, gotten complaints about that seem to be um, people constructing uh, kind of cloud runtime environments uh, where they, they want to containerize uh, the components of their runtime environment. So if they're going to use a SCSI storage uh, within a, a container or a virtualization runtime, um, then they want to take the SCSI parts and throw them in a container for their own deployment. And uh, as soon as you try that, uh, it doesn't work. And then um, they come and complain uh, to the iSCSI, to the open iSCSI people about the user space tool not working. Uh, and if you go and look at it, it's actually um, not a problem in the user space code. It's the kernel side of all the control APIs. Uh, just don't work in a network namespace. Um, so uh, people have been kind of limping along with the workaround of uh, putting it in a container but always using uh, the host network, uh, and you're kind of res restricted to that. So um, the the first thing that fails and the main thing is the uh, Netlink uh, iSCSI commands just weren't listening uh, on anything other than the initial namespace. Uh, that was a really easy fix, and I thought it was going to be a really easy fix and that that was going to solve it. Uh, at that point, um, you actually have a problem in that you can run multiple user spaces um, because we were essentially enforcing a singleton uh, through uh, reserving a, a, a Unix socket name uh, for IPC. Uh, so once that goes to different namespaces, you can have multiple daemons running, and they all start um, trying to take over all of the iSCSI sessions on the system. <laughs> and so they all want to uh, recover all the sessions and and things start getting reset, and it's a giant mess. So uh, the solution there uh, was to then start filtering out all of the transport objects in SysFS, because that is what it uses to find everything uh, from the kernel side. So uh, the iSCSI transport has a, a host and an iFace, which is uh, sort of a representation of a network configuration on a host, and then the session and a connection, even though we only do one connection per session, and then an endpoint, <laughs> which is uh, a representation of whatever the driver uses uh, in, if, instead of a socket if it's not just software TCP. Um, and then there's these uh, flash node uh, SysFS interfaces that QLA4 has. The, the patch that had to change to do the filtering on that because they were implemented as bus devices, which can't do namespace filtering. So um, I switched them all over to class devices. Um, and that is all I want to say about uh, QLA4. <laughs> yeah, sure. Namespace aware. Uh, can't you just use the interface? Because the way namespaces work, e Every network interface can be in one and only one namespace. So if you just pick by network interface for the outbound connection, you automatically get the namespace as well. That might be a, 
a simpler way of doing it. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the kernel just has a list of network interfaces. Right. But and as long as you can get that list unfiltered, uh, you can just select the correct network interface, and every network interface is in one and only one network namespace. So you're looking at it the other way around. You're saying, give me the network namespace, then what interfaces can I see? But if you just did it by interface, you'd be able to, you'd automatically be in the network namespace. So there's there's a couple of one um, we don't always uh, bind a session directly to a specific network interface. Right. So, okay, okay, that's so sometimes what I we just just use uh, default and yeah. then it, it gets routed to wherever. Um, and, that, and then uh, a lot of these uh, iSCSI transport objects um, aren't actually. So what we care about supporting for this is uh, just the software. TCP initiator driver. A lot of these objects are created by uh, offload devices for their management. And so basically, we just want to hide them so that we don't start interfering with them. Yeah. So, and that, that really been. is the thing that we normally just have an IP address. So, in order to get to, a, to the interface, we would have to follow the entire routing table. Yeah. So, if you do an outbound wildcard binding, you have to know the network namespace that you're binding to. I was just thinking an alternative way is if you pick the interface first, then you've got it. Yes, if, if, you, if you're if you able to do so, but occasionally you don't, don't really want to do so because you just have, you really, the only thing you're interested at is the IP address. And you simply couldn't care less where, across which interface this particular IP address is reachable from. Which has other issues, especially, especially if it comes to multipathing, yes, I know. But still, that's the default, default way we're doing. Okay, yeah, just, just a suggestion, sorry. Okay, yeah, and as, as we'll move on real quick here, we'll see that it's, it's actually not um, a tremendous amount of change uh, to do this, and this approach um, ended up fixing uh, all of the communication issues on the kernel side, uh, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see that we didn't have to change uh, the user space at all, so we remain backwards compatible um, with the existing uh, open iSCSI tools. Um, yeah, so this is the entire patch that we have out uh, currently. Uh, I think this addresses all of the known uh, issues that we'd seen with this. There are uh, very minor changes to uh, all of the iSCSI drivers. Um, just primarily around, uh, I've got a slide that shows uh, what the interfaces are that had to change. Um, and almost all of the changes are in SCSI transport iSCSI, and almost all of that is in ensuring that the SysFS objects get namespace filtering based on network namespaces turned on. We ensure that all the SysFS objects are um, rooted to a host, uh, with one exception for ISER with their endpoints. Um, and so uh, the uh, iSCSI host device uh, lives in a network namespace now as these kind of control plane objects um, consider part of, of networking. Uh, and then everything else is attached to the host and, and follows along with that. Um, so really this is the, the kind of interface changes uh, for uh, TCP and ICER. Um, ICER mostly, we accidentally broke it and then I had to fix it and then once I fixed it, um, I realized that it was not going to be a very much work to make it also namespace aware. So went ahead and did that. Um, the get namespace callback is a little weird, but it, it has to do with the way that the transport class objects get instantiated, and there's not really um, a, a way for the driver to tie into that cleanly. So there's uh, there's this one callback uh, into the specific driver to, to try to match up um, a host with a network namespace. Uh, and in the two converted drivers, um, that then takes the namespace to use from uh, where the netlink command uh, came from in the first place. Um, 
and then um, the session create net and EP connect net are calls to deal specifically with the way that uh, TCP works where it creates sessions and then just creates a virtual host to go with it so you don't have a host ahead of time uh, to attach to so you know, to specify the uh, the network uh, when it's being created and I serve very similarly with uh, endpoints um, it wants to create this iSCSI endpoint object uh, as the first thing uh, and then uh, create the RDMA associations before it creates uh, virtual hosts and sessions Uh, and then the, the things that caused us to do the, there's like three lines of change in uh, every other iSCSI driver um, were around the fact that endpoints uh, previously had just been kind of virtual uh, devices um, that weren't parented to anything in SysFS. Uh, so we uh, changed that to uh, attach them to a host uh, where we could. Um, and otherwise uh, create them directly in a network for ICER and then uh, look everything up within a, a specific namespace. Um, and so that's really it. Um, I did have, oh here. Anything else you want to say? Uh could you say a little bit about the net exit stuff that we have to do to clean up? Right. So um, one, one of the things that we were trying to figure out what to deal with was uh, namespace uh, lifetimes and, and what to do with the exit. Um, and we ended up not trying to hold the namespace uh, for an iSCSI session. Um, because you just end up with dangling sessions off in a namespace that no longer has a process attached to it and it, you can't really recover it. So uh, when the namespace exits, uh, we do have cleanup code that just shuts everything down. Um, there's uh, a bit of a weirdness and I can, I can show it to you with uh, TCP in that you, um, if you're running a containerized iSCSI D and then you throw that away, um, there are still open kernel sockets with the session. Uh, but like I'm, I'm using uh, Podman containers. And so when the container goes away, uh, all your routes go away and it stops working, but it's still alive in the kernel. Um, and so if you are running with keep alives enabled, uh, that will time out and then the error recovery will uh, close the sockets and then the namespace will finally go away once it's not being held open by the active sockets and then we'll do all the cleanup on the iSCSI side. But um, Lee did discover that if you're running without any sort of keep alive and you didn't have any traffic that got cut off, um, then it's just a nice idle TCP session sitting in the kernel with a nice cozy session seemingly attached to it doing nothing, so. <laughs> um, I mean, we probably would need to ask Christian this, but um, can't we close the session when the namespace is destroyed? Wouldn't that be? Well, the problem is the namespace. Or rather, no, no, if the namespace is detached, not destroyed, because as you just said, they'd be lazily destroyed, so there is some sort of, well, whatever, keep a lifetime, whatever. Right. Right, so the, the problem is that the, we, we do all the cleanup fine once the namespace is destroyed, um, but there's a live socket that's keeping the namespace open. Any I.O. will trigger the cleanup too. You intercept the netlink, let, netlink event that says the device has gone away. Because what should happen when a namespace is shutting down is that all of them, if you've pulled away the routing, you've probably taken the network device down as well. If you can hook into that device, you can use that as the trigger for saying, yeah, the device has gone down, now I can close all the sockets, everything should just go away without needing the timeouts. And Netlink should send Possibly. an event that says that. That might be a possibility, yeah. We should be able to, you're right, that, that would, that would show up. It would be a netlink device. So, 
Um, so uh, this is actually just um, two VMs running on my laptop, uh, one of which is just a very simple uh, target configuration there uh, over on the left. Um, just actually going to get rid of that. And Uh, and then the other one, uh, I have created a couple of Podman containers. Um, it's just a minimal, you know, just a small uh, distribution base image. And then I add the Open SCSI tools onto it, um, inject an initiator name just so we have some configuration to start with that matches the target, and then run iSCSI D as, as PID1 for the container. Um, and then uh, if you run it, I just start up the container um, and then use uh, exec commands to go ahead and trigger login to the target uh, after it's running. So you can do that and it starts up and from the outside, we can still see all the SCSI level stuff. We can see the device. We can see that there is an iSCSI uh, host, but none of the uh, transport level objects uh, will show up in SysFS here. Uh, that will only be inside the container. And then just for fun, I have a second image that's the exact same thing, but built with uh, Tumbleweed instead of Fedora. So it's just a different build of the same tools. I can start that up. And we've got, you know, two different things uh, in here running. I want to mention too, we've tried to get some input from container folks and it's been like silence. So I don't really know if I'm not reaching the right people or if they don't care. <laughs> well, I just want to know, uh, will this work for them? Do they want other features besides this? And one thing I want to mention too, since I have a moment here, is that Hannes has mentioned this uh, earlier at the conference, we kind of would like to have device namespaces too, so that you could choose whether you wanted your storage to show up in all namespaces. And so that's just you know, you know, five second delay. That I just shut down, you know, for, kind of forced shut down the, uh, the container so that there was no clean log out first. And then you saw the five second delay until the keep alive triggered and then the cleanup took away everything after. So that's, the current state of where the patch set is. So. so what I would like from this conference is, besides input from anybody that has any, and comments is to get the patch set moving forward. Um, I think you put out the second or third version just a couple days ago. Yeah, it's been a few, yeah. So Lee, Lee, like you said, took, I had some, some older patches and uh, Lee was nice enough to uh, dig those up and, and get them back applying to uh, the current development tree because they'd bit rotted a bit. And uh, uh, then I've spent the past couple of weeks uh, kind of addressing a lot of uh, feedback that Hannes was nice enough to give and then some uh, bugs that I ran into myself doing some more testing. But uh, as far as we know, we're in a, a pretty good state with this right now. Thing too. And some, some people might realize too, uh, it was not too surprising to me that it looks like some other subsystems might do a similar thing like NVMe. Yeah, that's in, in, well, in, I wouldn't say in planning, but I, well, that's something I have in mind. And also um, the block device namespace is something which I spoke to Christian about it and he was also very much in favor of it. Or rather to be precise, precise not a block device namespace but rather a device namespace, i.e. to attach a namespace to a struct device itself. Um, which, yeah, would be cool, sorta. 
has some implications which you really need to sort out because we can't just blank out any device. Some devices are actually quite useful and you actually need them to make your system do anything. Let's say def null or def t2i, you really want to have them. So there is a problem. So if you look at network namespaces, they're what's called label namespaces. That means every network device can be in one and only one namespace. Yes. And is that really what you want for device no. namespaces, like you say, so for DevNull? That is precisely the thing. That is the issue which, uh, which is as of yet unresolved, which is also why I haven't followed up upon this, because I would need to talk to the so maintainer telling me how can I do, uh, how can I have a general device which show up in all namespaces. But there is another thing called a device C group that you could use. It's not a namespace. <laughs> what it tries to do is it tries no. to filter device visibility by a set of rules <sighs> in a particular namespace. So I take it you've, you've looked at this. And yes, I did. And I quickly realized that even worse than namespaces. So, I mean, the filter is... Uh, that's, uh, yeah. The, yeah. But the warning about label-based namespaces is it's peculiarly suitable to networking because you tend either to push up a device into the network or to create a VF pair, one that goes into the namespace and the other that attaches to a bridge in a different namespace and you just build your routing topologies. What you'll find with the device namespace is, let's say you've got this huge 50 terabyte device and you push it all through to one thing and then you think, well, but I wanted to use Device Mapper to split this up and to then serve it out to yeah. other containers and either you have to do something like VF and device mapper so you can have a one-to-one uh, -one device with one point endpoint in one namespace and another in another or you have to figure that devices can't just be exclusively in one namespace they need to be in a set of namespaces and that therefore means that device to namespace mappings are no longer one-to-one -one, and then it becomes phenomenally complicated yeah, so, so the guess, semantics okay. yeah. are the thing it's semantics, it's semantic, it's semantic will, be, will be tricky that is um, I, I get you I grant you that um, and yes you might you are right eventually you might be having requiring something like well a def link so as you just said, so basically VF, device map VF, so DM li linear on steroids, essentially, yeah. where one end is in one name, so the other and the other. Yes, I guess we really would, not to, um, would need to, to have that. But um, having device namespaces would solve quite some issues, which are, as, are, are as of now unresolved. Um, NPIV is one of these. You, uh, the fiber channel driver has the uh, ability to basically virtualize itself. You can just give them a WWPN and then you suddenly have another host. And the idea here is that this virtual host which you've created is actually or should be passed to the guest. But we can't because it's really a virtual construct. Essentially, it's just a struct device or a struct SCSI host and with no hardware attached to it. So we have nothing which you could pass to, uh, pass to the VM because there literally is nothing which we, what we can do. So it will always show up in the host. At the same time, everything which shows up underneath it is re really should only be visible to the guest. And so we always have to have weird tooling around that to ensure right, okay, and you know any device showing up on this particular house really belongs to that VM, so which is horrible. The other thing to consider about device namespaces is how they're going to interact with mount namespaces. For instance, if I mount a file system from a device that's in a device namespace and push it through to a mount namespace in a different device namespace, should I still be able to see the, should that operation be legal and I can still see the file system or should it fail? Does see, it matter? Or rather, no, hang on. Um, it, this is. To my understanding, the namespaces themselves are primarily user space thing. That's what I, I look at it for the device namespaces, because that's primarily what can we access from user space. Yes. Once so we are within the kernel, well, yes, we might be looking at the namespace, but then again, if we don't, we don't. So, what so you're telling really, me is I'm not sure whether there's, an, whether there's really an issue once we are inside the kernel. The kernel would be blind to the device namespace, so it yes. would be able to do mounting uh, yeah. into any. Yes. Uh, mount namespace it wanted to and you yeah. wouldn't care. Yeah, I suppose that works. So, exactly. And because in the end, once you've mounted your thing, you don't really care about the underlying block device. Well, that's the point. I mean, that's why there is no device namespace currently, because containers are pretty much file-based. Exactly. So they wouldn't really care. 